Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. This is an interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. Available in video format at funkinstuff.net and on YouTube, Truth and Rhythm can now also be enjoyed on the go in its audio podcast version at funkinstuff.net, iTunes, and other leading providers. I'm Scott Dr. GX Goldfine, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, the First Guide of Funk. Get your copy at Amazon. Whether you're listening or watching, I thank you very much for your support. And you're going to be rewarded today because uh, we have a fantastic guest. And that guest is keyboardist and composer Kevin Tony, former leader of the sensational funk jazz group, The Blackbirds, which was founded in the early 1970s by a renowned trumpeter and at the time chairman of Howard University's Department of Jazz Studies, Donald Byrd. The five man band included uh, Tony's fellow students, Keith Kilgo, on vocals and drums, bassist Joe Hall, sax clarinet player Alan Barnes, and guitarist Barney Perry and Orville Saunders. Signed to Fantasy Records from 1974 to 1980, the Blackbirds released six studio albums plus a soundtrack. They notched 10 top 40 R&B hits, as well as several popular album tracks that also received airplay during the period. Among those songs were Do It Fluid, Walking in Rhythm, Happy Music, Rock Creek Park, City Life, Flying High, Time is Moving, Soft and Easy, Supernatural Fear, uh, Feeling, and Unfinished Business. Several of those songs were from 1975 City Life, which for my money, end to end, is one of the uh, decade's landmark funk albums. And that's certainly saying something because that was the golden age for, for that music. But the Blackbirds did it all with a unique, smooth jazz sensibility that set them apart in a very crowded field. And like all the best music, it has completely stood the test of time. That would be impressive enough, but there's much more to the Kevin Tony story. A true Renaissance man, post Blackbirds, he established himself on record and on stage as a formidable and highly regarded jazz pianist, as well as, as an author with two published books and as a public speaker. Coming up, we'll find out how Kevin began his life in music. We'll talk about his college years and the formation of the Blackbirds. We'll get into the band's albums and tracks that have gone from hits to classics. We'll find out why they disbanded and how he kept busy in the 1980s. We'll talk about his career as a jazz artist and also his other varied interests and causes. And then we'll find out what Kevin's up to today. So with all that, Kevin, I'm switching to you. How are you today? I'm doing great. I'm just... Um Delighted to be on the show and just listening to you with some history by. I mean, the uh, the facts that you mentioned and going from hits to classics, you know, that's amazing. That's amazing because when we started that journey back in um, 72, 73, uh, it's just being students at Howard University studying with Donald Byrd. It was like a dream come true, right? Going to study with one of your heroes, right? The guy who makes records, who you're listening to, you've listened to. Um, you know, in high school, you, you know, Herbie Hancock was his pianist at the time. And of course, uh, Herbie was one of my earlier influences. And um, so, you know, I, I just say, you know, it's amazing that from that point of going to Howard, I can recall my first day uh, meeting Donald and to where we are today. What a journey, you know, and who would have thought? Um, yeah, who would have thought, first of all, hit records? Maybe, okay, college students making records and, you know, something to happen. But it, it, it just it skyrocketed. I mean, it just went, it, it, it went in um, hyperspace. And like you said, from hit records to classics, here we are 40-plus years. Uh, I don't know if anybody dreams about that. And, and, and at that age, being 18, 19 years old, that I had any clue that... Uh, that would be the journey, let alone the other things you mentioned. And then you, you ran off the songs, uh, which brings back a lot of memories. We could certainly get into those. And I will say this, though, uh, where we connect right away. Uh, first of all, you got the story right, okay? You got, you know, most, most of the stories right. I will say two things. One, Orville Saunders uh, was not our original guitar player. Now, it was Barney. So Orville came really two records later. And Orville came at a pinnacle time because Orville, first Orville Saunders' first record, 
by the way, we knew Orville. He was a student at school, but there was Barney Perry first from Buffalo. And so Barney was on those first two albums. And but Orville would come on 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 the City Life album. And and from there we went gold from there. I, at, by the time we hit City Life, we were on our we were on our way with the record before with Walking Rhythm, Fly and Start, but you know, when Orville came, uh, he, he he came at a point where we were really blossoming to have huge success. And I will say this too, for me, I believe our best record that we made, I think they were all great, that they all have individual things, but the one um, that resonates to me would be City Life would certainly be my, one of my favorites of the Blackbirds. So being away from it so long, I, I can. There, there are a lot of hits. There are a lot of songs that resonate, and um, and so we're going to stay from there. So you know, I'm glad to be on your show. Uh, I'm glad to be able to be here and share the history and legacy of that and beyond. You know. Well, we're so glad to have you, Kevin. Man, it's, a, it's been an amazing ride, and it's still going. So, and where yeah. where are you coming to us from today? I'm coming from Los Angeles, um, the Los Angeles, California area, in my home. You know, you're, you're seeing, you're, your viewers are looking at my, my studio, uh, where I do a lot of work. I spend a lot of time in here, you know, uh, working on my projects. Um, but this is my home studio office. And so I'm in Los Angeles uh, this summer, um, um, uh, grinding away on some things that, you know, we'll, we'll get the chance to talk about, um, you know, during the course of uh, our conversation. Fantastic. Thanks, Kevin. All right. Well, so we're going to get back into those records and, and City Life 2 is a special place in my heart. So I uh, can't wait to get more into that. But let's take a step way back first and, right. and talk about, you know, how, how you first got into music. Uh, where were you from originally? And, you know, walk, walk us to getting to Howard University. Sure. Um, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. Um, I come from a musical family. So at age four, by age five, I was taking lessons, classical lessons from my, my sister. Um, I had um, an older sister and two older brothers from my mom's first marriage. So I was the baby of the family. Mm -hmm. So um, I um, recall always hanging around and there was always music in the house. My, my mother did not play. I don't even think I ever heard her sing. Mm -hmm. uh, but her and my father certainly loved music enough where uh, they let us do it all the time. And it was this uh, upright piano downstairs uh, in our basement where I grew up at and we play on it. So, um, you know, I come from a musical family and from grades, the third grade, from the third grade to the 12th grade, graduating from high school, I played three instruments. You know, I started off on piano. By the time I was in the third grade, I, I added cello and saxophone. Hmm. And so I kept these three instruments up um, through grade school. My first gigging instrument was on a saxophone, and I would, you know, gig and do uh, parties. You know, I can recall, you know, playing in the basements of some parties, uh, blue lights, and the band would get five bucks, and that was a whole big deal. I said, we must be on to something, right? <laughs> Getting paid to play music. Um, so, you know, I did music. I did those instruments with the cello. I did orchestral stuff. I played in, in, in symphony orchestras. I, I had a scholarship to Interlochen School of, uh, uh, of Music um, in uh, Interlochen, uh, Michigan. It's like a school on the level of Tanglewood. Uh, really heavy stuff, right? Um, and on the piano, I studied classical music. Now, I got into... Outside of classical music, I got my first jazz bug um, in the, I think I was in the eighth grade, and I was over a friend's house, and he put on a Horace Silvers record called Songs to My Father. And he said, you know, Kevin, you, you know, we're going to play, uh, you know, because we were going to play in the talent contest, and we were trying to figure out what we were going to do. So my friend Charles Jackson puts on a Horace Silvers record, and I fall in love with it. So, so I remember learning the melody. And I learned about three choruses of it, of, of his solo. You know, it, it just fit so well. And, and my friend Charles, we both played cello in the orchestra. So what he did, I played piano, and he played um, he played the bass on the last two strings of the cello, right? So that's my first jazz book. Now, um, let's forward to high school. 
Um, I go to this school, high school called Cass Technical High School, which, by the way, Donald Burke went there and, and, and a lot of other um, well-known jazz musicians and musicians, period. But just in the area of jazz and popular music, Donald Burke went there, Ron Carter went there, the Jones brothers like Hank Jones, Thad Jones, those guys um, had gone there. Um, but when I went there, I didn't know anything that they had went there. It was just one of the best schools to go to. And so in going to high school there, um, I get an education in music that would allow me once I went to college that I would be able to pass. The program was so rich that I was able to pass out of all the theory courses when I came to Howard. So now, um, doing high school, I'm playing with all the top jazz musicians by this time, okay? I, I'm the 17, 16 year old kid. My big brother has to take me to the gigs, drop me off, or my mom. And I'm in the nightclubs playing with the big boys, you know, we're playing. And at this point, my interest, even though coming from Detroit, is really strictly jazz. By the time I'm high school, um, I, I just, I am the jazz addict. Um, I had, uh, in, I think around 11th grade, I remember walking into this record store in downtown Detroit called the Land of Hi-Fi. And it was near uh, my high school. And I just went by there one day and went there and, and something changed my life there. It was this musician named Billy McCoy. And Billy is still with us. And he worked at the store and he was a pianist. Little did I know then, but he, he saw me looking at some records and he said, well, oh, well, you like jazz. You know, I guess I was looking at some Herbie Hancock records. He said, well, look, if you like Herbie, Listen to this. Listen to Bill Evans. And then he said, well, well, if you like that, listen. Then he took me to Keith Jarrett. I must have stayed in that record store for about three hours. And he took me through just about the history of jazz piano. And then after that, we had this bond. And I was like a kid in the candy store. He took me across the street to Hudson's store. It was a department store in Detroit. And this time, they used to have pianos there. So he went in there and found a piano, and he played some of that stuff. It was amazing. So that put a jazz bug into me that um, would carry me into high school and carries me into even what I do now, but does I talk about the excitement. But anyway, I remember him um, getting me some albums and we would hang out. And so in Detroit, I played a lot of jazz. I was interested in playing um, uh, Giant Steps, uh, the Coltrane music. I was interested in playing the Miles Davis uh, with the Herbie Hancock um, uh, Tony Williams, Ron Carter, that that stuff. Uh, I started listening to that sleeping. I, you know, at, at, when I go to bed at night, I would have the headphones on listening to that stuff. I do my homework, but I get that out the way that I listen to that. And I recall my last year in high school, uh, I met another friend of mine named Kamal, whose name is Kamal Kenyatta now, who was also the producer for Gregory Porter Records. Mm -hmm. And we struck up this bond in one summer. Uh, we... Um, uh, hung out with each other, and we must have practiced 12 hours a day at each other's house. We drove his mother crazy, drove my mother's crazy, right? And so we were absorbing all these things, right? Um, and I was absorbing all these things. So I graduate from high school, right, after this point. Plan, you know, I played all the jazz in Detroit, played with the top guys, Marcus Belgrave, Sam Sanders, Harold McKinney, you name them. In Detroit, um, I, I, I was able to experience that. So I knew I wanted to go to college. But it's interesting enough, when I graduated from high school, I had no plans, really. It's not like I had done some home, you know, it's not like I had set something up to go somewhere. But I knew of three, two places I wanted to go. And then somebody told me about a third to show you how fate and, and, and destiny work. I thought about Berkeley School of Music. And I, at the time, I thought about going to Indiana U because there was a guy named Dave Baker there. And then someone told me about, hey, there's Donald Byrd at Howard University. I said, Donald Byrd, and then I thought about it. And of course, they told me a lot about him, uh, especially some of my mentors in Detroit. And I hadn't, you know, I had listened to Donald Byrd's music. I listened to Crystal Redentor as a kid. And, and, and I love that song, and I love the piano player who was Herbie Hancock. So here's my logic. Here's how I get to Howard. I said to myself, you know, at that time, Herbie Hancock and McCoy Tyner, they were like two of my top, I idled them. I mean, you know, whenever they came to town as a youngster, and I was 16, 17 years old, I would find the club that they were in if they were at a club, and I would go sit under the piano. Literally, sit under the piano and watch them, and I wanted to absorb every note that they played. I wanted to get everything, right? <laughs> um, so my logic was, you know what? 
if Herbie Hancock, if Donald Byrd can play with Herbie Hancock, then he must be okay. Now, now the, the irony of this is this. See, Donald discovered Herbie when Herbie was 20 years old. He came to Chicago and picked him up. But see, me thinking and not putting it together, putting it together my way, I said, you know, if Donald played with Herbie, he's got to be okay. And in truth, it was really Herbie playing with Donald. And Donald was the master and musician, and Donald had gave him an opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. So, but that was good. And so here's what happened. I remember it had to be late July or something. I, I only had a few weeks to show you how quick this went to get to Howard. And I remember making a call to Donald Bird. Somebody gave me his number. I made a call to him. I got him on the phone, and we talked. And I told him, you know, about me and et cetera, et cetera. And there was already this chemistry. He hadn't heard me play, but, you know, I told him, you know, who I was playing with, where I went to school at, my teachers. He knew my teachers. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, Kevin, you got to come to Howard. And you know what? Uh, like I said, probably three to four weeks before school started, that's, that, that, that changed everything. I filled out the applications, and I remember going to my dad at the time. Imagine this. I go to my dad three weeks before or two weeks before I go to school and say, Dad, you know, I'm getting ready to go to college now, but I need I don't have the funds to get in there. You know, they, they were going to try to hook up scholarships when I got there, but it was so quick. So I remember asking my dad, I said, can you help me out with the tuition? And he looked at the number and the number was like about seven hundred dollars to get in there for the semester. Right. So thank goodness my father said, hey, he wrote a check out. It was cool. So I was on my way to Howard University pretty much. Uh, and, and, and so I remember my first day meeting Donald. Um, it was, um, I remember he was, he was cool. He was, he was easy to be around with. I remember he said he had me play for him. I played and he, and, he, and, and after I played and I played, I want to play the fastest thing I knew, right? <laughs> I want to really impress him, you know, his, you know, Donald Byrd. And I was easy because he had a rehearsal that day. But then after the rehearsal, he asked me to play. And then he said, okay, so I'm going to call you Detroit Flash. And then from that point on, tell you the truth, the, the way it is, I became at that point, moving forward, Donald Byrd's right-hand man. Uh, I think I, at that point, there was also Barney Perry around. So Barney and I bonded. This was before the Blackbirds, and this was before Donald had the hits flight time and all this stuff. So we're two students, Barney and I, we bonded because Barney came there with the kind of maturity playing like George Benson. He was kind of, he, he had a maturity to his sound. And so we bonded, uh, we hung out. Um, and then Donald, what he did immediately, and when I say immediately, within the next, within a, a few months, we were, both Barney and I were playing all the Donald Bird's gigs with all his New York jazz buddies. So we we go on the East Coast anytime Donald had um, gigs, because he was still back and forth from New York as a teacher at Howard. Um, he would take us, two rookie students, and he had the band Joe Chambers, uh, David Williams, I mean, these jazz legends, Harold Vick, you know, these guys from the 60s and 50s and 60s, uh, Harold Vick, uh, Billy Harper. And guess what? On piano, to show you how Donald was really making the transition and hooked me up, he had Stanley Cowell on piano. Now, a lot of people out there may not know who Stanley Cowell is, and he's an unsung hero, but I got to tell you, if whoever's listening here who doesn't know about Stanley Cowell, go get you some Stanley Cowell records. He is a pianist beyond extraordinary. He grew up in um, Toledo, Ohio. He, he, he was able to see... Um, uh, Art Tatum, the great Art Tatum, and he plays on that level and um, beyond. Anyway, so Stanley Cowell's in the group playing piano, and I'm playing electric piano. So I'm positioned with all these guys. Hey, and Kev Kevin, Ke sorry to interrupt you, but I actually just saw a clip on YouTube this week from 1973, you playing with Donald and, and the band, and there was another keyboard player. Would that have been possibly the the you know lineup you're talking about, or? No, that would not be the lineup. That's another lineup in Montreal Jazz Festival. Um, so, yeah, no, that wouldn't be him. But Stanley Kyle is this great. Um, so, so, so I move it a little bit forward. You know, um, it's, 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 you know, I get excited talking about the story. But anyway, so for, for the, so for the next two years, it's really Barney and I for that uh, doing gigs with Donald Byrd. Um, and then the second year, my second year there, I ran into some um, Keith Kilgo. Uh, was the man he was the Tony Williams of that generation in DC he was like the Art Blakely young he, he was the drum phenom and so I met him 
um, that my second, my, my first summer, and we connected because he was home from going to school at Bradley. We connected. We started playing together. He knew of Donald. And then I told Donald, Keith Kilgore was back. And then Donald said, you know, Donald talked Keith into coming to Howard the next year. And then Keith talked Joe Hall, the bass player. They because he him and Joe were buddies, right? They grew up together and they had a high school high school band. So now the second year, um, Donald removes some of the um, 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 name players and he's replacing them with us. He's he's coming up with the student band. So now it's four of us: Keith Kilgore on drums, uh, Barney Perry on guitar, me on keyboards, uh, Joe Hall on bass. We still have Joe Chambers and a percussion player Ray Armando and Donald. <clears throat> and then Alan comes the next semester, okay? Our third year into, uh, 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 somewhere near near the third year, we meet, um, um, I meet Alan, and I go back to Detroit to pick him up because I'm going home for the summer, and Donald says, hey, I want you to pick up our new saxophone player, and we become roommates. So that's how I walk through to get to where we are now. Let me just tell you the setup to where from Donald Bird and studying with him and all those things we did, we got to the point where we had a student band then. Donald was ready to have a student band and we traveled to do all of his gigs. Now also, um, 1972, the end of that year, end of 73, Donald releases um, Blackbird. that has got Flight Time, um, Slop Jar Blues and all those songs, right? It is a revolutionary record. Little did we know at the time, but you know it was going to become the top-selling record for Blue Note until Nora Jones topped him off in 2002 with her song. Right? That's quite a lot to say, and that's the story in itself. But anyway, so Donald get, gets this new success of this hit record that was produced by two of his earlier students, Fonz and Larry Mizell. And so now we are traveling around the country playing that music, plus the jazz tunes. By the way, the first two years, we're doing straight ahead jazz. Straight ahead jazz, a lot of that with the new jazz, the jazz of the 60s and then some of his recordings. I wrote a lot of songs. Whoever wrote songs could bring them. Donald was very generous in playing our songs. He played Barney's songs. Barney and I wrote. I wrote quite a bit for that group. I have We have unrecorded material. Um, that's you know that's just out there but anyway um we did this music and then donald had to hit and so we began to play those songs and travel around the country we began traveling to specifically we were well received with the um, historically black universities hbcus around the country and we went there and we you know we're, wow it's just like it was a transition we were students during the week full-time students by the way right and then on the weekend, mostly weekends, we'd be gigging. We'd get in the car and a station wagon. I remember we had a station wagon. We drove around the country. Uh, you know, this is before we got big and had hit records and stuff like that. But we would drive around. Um, uh, we, you know, we drive around and we do these gigs. And so we were the Donald Bird Septet. And then after Donald had that success, and that success was just huge. We had no idea what the hugeness of it is, but you know what? It, it, it was so huge that historically speaking, you can look back and if the, and if the historians get it right, uh, they should say that Donald Byrd, that record uh, was was one, a pioneering record that signaled a new fusion of jazz and R and B, without a doubt. Okay, and that's and and then the Blackbird sound was based on that when we built that foundation from there. But like like Miles Davis fused jazz with rock, Donald Byrd has to be credited with fusing jazz with R&B. And he did it in a way because he had songs. And his songs uh, were instrumental in nature and had jazz improvisation, but they were R&B and they, and they had the dance tracks of the day, the dance feel, and they had vocals. Some of them were lead vocals, but most of them were group vocal hooks. And um, you'll have to thank, uh, we'll have to thank the, the architects of that, uh, Fonts and Larry Mizell. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that, put all that together, and um, 
you know, now Donald's at a position where he wants to record the Blackbirds, right? And we're talking about, we're looking at, this is 1973 now. Um, and he knows Orrin Keatnews. Orrin Keatnews is the great jazz producer um, uh, uh, from Riverside Records in the 50s, 60s, Fantasy Records. The legendary Orrin Keatnews. If you out there, if you know jazz, if you... If you know jazz and you don't know who he is, I don't care if you're coming from smooth jazz or wherever, go back and learn your history about Orrin Keepers. So he knows Orrin. And so he talks Orrin into getting us a deal, and he said it was a matter of what we were going to call ourselves. And so I remember us meeting in, the, in our hotel room, talking about what we were going to call ourselves. We, the names came out, the Collegians, this, that, and the other. And then, you know, Donald probably thought this all the time. He was just probably seeing, well, if we did come up with something better, he had a, he had a name. And then, so, and then he said, well, we'll call you the Blackbirds, right? And, uh, and that was the name of our first record. Now, the Blackbirds, B-Y-R-D, obviously, um, a lot of connotations from that. You know, um, obviously, the bird is, you know, the spelling of that um, was indicative as a tribute to him, his last name. And, and Black, because at that time, um, you know, we just we had just come out of this civil rights era. So we're in the early 70s. And so now the country, you're talking about, you got Richard Pryor doing stuff. You got the Funkadelics. You got Earth, Wind & Fire. All these groups just starting. Afros were in. Mm -hmm. It was Afrocentric. So it was, it, was, it was a great time to be black in America and be proud of it. And so, and, and to own it and to be of that generation and not think twice about it. So yeah, we were the black birds. Um, and, and, and that was part of it, that we were proud of our blackness and how that connected. So anyway, we recorded our first record uh, called The Blackbirds. Going in, we went into the studio, didn't have any charts, no music. I don't think we had any charts, well, except the songs that we wrote. But this, yeah, that, that one right there, right, exactly. That's got the uh, Vincent Van Gogh painting there. So we go in the studio, cut it, and um, lo and behold, it hits the radio, and we get some hits like in um, what's that? What's the first song on that album? Do it fluid. Do it fluid becomes our first hit. It's on the R and B charts. I forgot where it charted at, but um, it put us on the map. And so from there, the rest is history, and we can talk about the dots. But that's the journey from me starting music to going to Howard to going to Cast Tech, coming to Howard University. Um, playing with Donald um, and, and playing with a lot of other people in D.C. You know, in between doing the do gigs with Donald Burt, I played with all the jazz people and R&B people in, in D.C. as well. So there you are. That's, that's that story. Wow, that's an amazing, amazing story. I mean, talk about, you know, learning on-the-job training um, and what an experience um, and the great music that came out of it, too. Just incredible. So take a breath, <laughs> drink a water, tell some story, Kevin. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and I think the awesome thing about it, too, and here's the thing that separates us from anybody else in history, at least thus far. There have been some groups who have got together in, high, at, 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 in college. The Commodores, I think, got together, um, mm -hmm. uh, Midnight Star. But none has done it like the Blackbirds. And I'm just saying this, that we were full-time students and had our success as full-time students. So to have that dichotomy uh, of being in school and really studying and studying with the professor, Dr. Bird, and then getting the, the opportunity to go out in the real world and make that experiment happen, because that was his philosophy. He wanted to take the academic experience and make it real in all aspects, from the recording to the live shows. So that was exceptional. And, and, and see, there's more to that story, too. It's more to the fact, it's more than we were the students. And we had the chemistry together. And obviously, we had the talent. And the timing was right. And, and, and for sure, it wasn't luck. I'm, I'm going to, the only thing that's luck in life is when you go to Vegas and try to play the slot machines or Atlantic City. I, I'm sure it was, I, I know it was destiny and it was God's way of blessing everyone. 
um, and for things to work together. But I'll say this, the more of it is this, not only did we learn musicianship and how to put it together, really, Donald was good at taking your gifts and, taking, and telling you how and explaining and giving you some tools of how you can take your game, musical game up. Hey, we're back here in studio. We had a bit of a glitch, but we're back with Kevin Tony, and uh, we're going to pick up the story again from, you know, when those first two records were made uh, back in 1974. And uh, tell us, tell us about those ses sessions, Kevin. Yes, uh, the sessions were um, they were an adventure for us. That was my actual second record making. My first record I made with a guy named Andrew White, and we did a jazz quartet and went in the studio and just cut everything in real time. So this one we laid down, you know, with the Blackbirds, our first record, we had Larry and Fonce Mizell there, Donald Bird's producers, because they came to co-produce the record with Don. And um, we had a couple of our songs, right? So I had a, a song, uh, so I think all the band members had a song, and then we recorded some of the um, Mizell grooves, and we just created some grooves. And, um, I remember the way the, the, the Mizells recorded was an education because he, they would come out and rehearse us on, on certain sections of the songs, you know, the A groove, the B groove, the third, you know, the C groove or the third part of it. And in, they would go back into the control room and we count off the tune. And I remember the way we know how to change to the next section is that they, they had signs up. So they put number one. And then when it was getting hot, number two, mm. number three. And, and that's how we put together some of those songs, right? You know, like um, um, I want to say The Funky Junkie. Um, what else did we do on that album? We had um, uh, Gut Level was a song, so we already knew that. We actually had a chart for that. Um, uh, uh, what was the first cut on that album again? Do It Fluid. Do It Fluid, yeah. And that was – nope. There were no sections to change on that. I was just a straight groove. So, you know, the experience was that we went in and recorded the tracks. Um, and um, and then after we put the tracks together, we would come back for, you know, whatever time that took on the amount of days. Um, we'd come back and we put the solos on there. Um, we came back and put a few vocals on there, but for the most part, the vocals on that album, <laughs> Most of the vocals were sung by the Mizells and their crew. <clears throat> and we did instruments. We did what we knew we could do at that time. Except but Keith, Keith Kilgo sang, sang the lead on, um, on Do It Fluid. We sang a couple of backgrounds, but we weren't doing much singing. The singing wouldn't come until uh, the City Life album. That's when we actually started. Our voices were on the records. Um, so, you know, we, we, we cut the tracks. We put our solos on there. Um, it was a production, you know, 24 track, um, um, uh, production and, you know, we laid down the tracks and then we left the studio and we left and came back home to, to, to campus and Donald and, um, the Mizells, uh, put the record together. You know, they produced the records. <coughs> so <coughs> to understand our relationship, uh, with Donald Bird is that we, the Blackbirds, um, recorded separately from Donald. We had our own deal with Fantasy Records. Um, Donald had his own deal as an artist with Blue Note Records. His producers were the Mizell brothers. Donald was also our producer, as well as band leader, but in records, we were separate. We never cut a record together. The closest we came to cutting a record together was, I think, live in Central Park, where we did a few of Donald's songs. So. We were, the first record was also cut at Fantasy Studios, the historic Fantasy Studios in Berkeley, California. So we had the experience that you don't really have today much uh, that I know of, in that the record company had a, had a studio. Uh, we took pictures there. Uh, we took the photographs for the pictures there. Um, they had um, in-house, um, publicist, right? So we did all that there while we cut the record. It was kind of like a one stop. We did everything except sleep there. <laughs> uh, but it was fun. Um, 
And, you know, Alan Barnes was, was with us on that record. Of course, we had Perk Jacobs, a percussionist who was one of our students who, I think that's the only album that he made with us. Oh, I could be wrong. I'm not sure if he's on the fly and start with it. We'll have to take a look at that. But we had Keith Kilgo, we had um, Barney Perry. And, um, and so that song, you know, that record took off for us. I mean, uh, we were on the charts. We were on the R&B charts and the jazz charts. Not having a clue as to what that meant other than we were having a great time doing the concerts. We knew that a lot of girls lined up afterwards to show to see us. And um, we, uh, we had fun with that too. You know, we, we had our pick literally of, of, of that world, which is a whole nother discussion. We'll can circle back to that. But um, we were beginning to taste and have success. Now our second record, um, we continued the success of that and we recorded that I think you're right. We did record that back in 74. I think that came out late 74 or early 75. 74, yeah. Yeah, I remember recording that record. We recorded that record um, at the uh, record plant in Sausalito. Mm -hmm. Very cool studio. I mean, that was a historic studio. Everybody uh, of that era recorded out there. So I remember re making that record, you know, we can, you know, we had songs again, most of us had written songs. In fact, I had two songs, maybe three songs on that one. And um, uh, Future Children, Future Hopes. Um, I'll have to pick up the album and look at it. Hold on for just a second, okay? <laughs> Matter of fact, uh, let me bring out my Blackbird stuff here. While, while you're doing that, if you can hear me, what was it like when you first heard Do It Fluid on the radio? Fantastic. It was, it, was, it was fantastic. I don't remember hearing it a lot, but we did. When we heard it, it was, it was, it was amazing uh, to, to know that we had a record that was getting played on the radio and that when we went to shows, people knew the lyrics. But the real amazing story, the real breakthrough, and the real revelation really came on after we recorded Flying Start, our second record, right? Um, I remember going to the studio, and by then, we kind of had a feel for what we thought maybe could have been the hit records or what was going to be hot, right? At that point, what was interesting was this. Um, two things, and, and I want to come back to Flying Start. When, when I came to study with Donald, it's interesting. I, after my first year, Donald sat me down and said, you know, Kevin, look, um, we've been playing jazz, and I know you came here to study jazz, but you know what? I want you to listen to these records. And he put up Stevie Wonder. Um, he put up Billy Preston and said, I want you to, you know, I want you to get to play like that. I want you to put that playing in your style. And I remember saying to Donald, so funny, I said, Donald, you know, I didn't really sign up for that. I said, I came here to study jazz. What's this? You know, I don't know, you know, but you know, me wanting to, you know, you know, he was, he, he was my mentor. Uh, he was the band leader. He was like a, a big brother figure too. I guess you call him more of a big brother. I wouldn't call him a father figure, but more of a big brother. Um, I paid attention and you know, it, um, you know, it, it, it kind of changed where we were headed, but it was good because that helped to give us a commercial, um, so to speak, um, viewpoint of the music business and be able to infuse the jazz that we came, because we all came from jazz backgrounds, most of us, to being able to merge that with what he was doing. So anyway, that being stated, and we're having fun now with the R&B jazz success because what makes us different and what made us different out of the gate was that we had R&B sensibility songs, R&B rhythms, R&B grooves, contemporary, we had synthesizers, but we played jazz over it. And Donald let us solo. It wasn't, it wasn't like you had to take a chump solo. You know, you could really play and stretch out within the context. I mean, we couldn't go and be John Coltrane and do a Love Supreme over that, but you could play jazz because that's what he was bringing about. So I remember call, uh, recording Flying Start. The recession went great. And, um, you know, we, we, we went home afterwards thinking, you know, okay, wow, we got some hot tunes on here. You know, because at that time, our inspiration then was becoming, you know, Earth, Wind, Fire. They were doing some great things. Um, Larry Graham and Graham Central Station. Um, 
cool in the game. Uh, we're listening to these people. We're listening to uh, uh, Mr. Magic. You know, I think we're listening to more as a group. We're listening to more of the R&B stuff plus the heavy jazz stuff. We're listening to all that stuff and kind of cycle it in there. But at this time, I think we, the group, the band, wants to try to be like Earth, Wind, and Fire, you know, or we want to try to be like um, uh, Ohio Players because we love, we were listening to that and it was great and trying to inflect that on our music. So by then, Flying Star, we think we kind of know what the grooves are going to be and the hit songs are going to be. And um, lo and behold, I remember being in school one morning, waking up, getting on the bus to go from the dorm to go to my classes at 8 in the morning. And what do I hear on the radio? Walking in rhythm. And nobody on the bus has, they have no clue who we are, who I am. You know, I'm just a student there. I mean, we're not famous yet, right? Uh, the music department knows about us, but not the school. And so I'm listening to that say, wow, that's incredible. And they're saying the Blackbirds and all that stuff. And I'm like a kid in a candy store. I almost like to want to say to everybody, hey, that's my record. I'm on the bus with about 50 other kids. But no, that didn't happen, you know. And so the amazing thing happened was that with that record, that record really broke us into pop stardom, so to speak. Uh, no, not so to speak. I mean, that song became so big. And you know what's interesting about it? It became so big that it put us on four charts. Back then, we were on the top uh, top pop charts. That song got the uh, number two uh, pop song in America on the pop charts, Billboard 100. It was on the top easy listening chart. They had an easy listening chart then. It was on the top jazz chart, and it was on the top R&B. Who else was doing that? I'm just saying, you know, when we look, when we're going to shine some light about some things and what Donald had accomplished through us and what God was really accomplishing through us to show how jazz, how what you consider jazz is popular here. So we had no clue how popular that song was until we started touring uh, our next round of gigs and we were on the Diana Shore show and she's singing Walking in Rhythm with us. <laughs> right. And then then we on the Dick Clark show on American Bandstand, playing not only our songs, Walking in Rhythm, which was hot at that time, that's our biggest song to the date, but we're playing Donald's stuff. Donald had Street Lady out. We're still playing his stuff that was jazz, but by this time, in truth, Walking in Rhythm surpasses anything Donald did as a single song, uh, because it, you know Donald's songs, as great as they were, they hit heavily in the R&B, but they didn't cross over into pop. And so with this group and that song, it took everything we were doing to a whole nother level. So look, we're students and stuff and we're, and we're, and we're, and we're seeing the success of this and, um, and thinking to ourselves, man, what, how do people hear in this song? How come they didn't hear the rest of these songs? The other songs are funkier than this. The other songs are this, that, and the other. We, we didn't, you know what? We didn't really appreciate the song. I mean, we, we, we cut it. You know, it was Barney's song. It was it was a, it was a cool song, but it wasn't a hip song. You know, we, we we said, how could they miss this? Shows you how much musicians know about recording songs, right? And what's going to hit. So anyway, look, history hits. It hits, and it really puts us on the map more. We're touring, we're touring, we're touring. By this time, some changes are being made in the group too. Um, we see as we move into the next tier of our um, success that there's a change made in the saxophone chair. <clears throat> and Alan Barn, uh, Barnes leaves the group. And we replace him with a high school buddy of mine called Jay Jones, who is now called Kamal Kenyatta, who, who also is the Greg Reporter's um, producer on Greg Reporter's latest two albums that have sold like hotcakes, especially in Europe. So now we're getting ready, and you know, we're touring the country. And by this time, let me tell you this. Here's what else that made the Blackbirds so unique that I, I haven't seen it duplicated yet. And, and this, this cements our place in history, without a doubt, from, from the horse's mouth, is that by this time in 74, in early 75, before we hit City Life, and we'll talk about that, now we're doing concerts through the week. Sometimes I'm missing school, okay? But who cared, right? And I'd get together with the teachers and, you know, we, you know, get the homework and we still kept that going. But by then, we're really gigging three, four times a week. And, and here's the gigs. Here's the more. 
on one on one weekend we could be playing a concert on the same bill with Earth, Wind, and Fire, Parliament, Funkadelic, Rufus, Graham Central Station, The Temptations, and more, and all the R&B groups of that day, all the top R&B groups, we're on a gig with them. I mean, and not opening act either. You know, we're next to the headliners. Between, you know, because we went out as Donald Byrd and the Blackbirds. That's how we were live. So live, we played Donald's music, he played our music, right? We did this with a six-piece group, by the way. Now, but then on the next weekend, we can be on a concert with all the top jazz fusion R&B groups of the day. So we'd be on a show with Herbie Hancock and the Headhunters with Chameleon and that stuff he's doing. Grover Washington, Mr. Magic, right? Cooling the game with what they were doing. Um, Chick Corea, how about that? We're on shows doing with Chick Corea. Um, so we have this dichotomy and then there's more on a given week and there was a point where we were doing tours opening up Donald Byrd and the Blackbird for the hottest com uh, comic actor cap comedian at the time Richard Pryor mm. we're doing shows with him doing our music and off a of walk in the rhythm it was incredible when I think about it today and then going back to school studying um, and taking music classes Et cetera, et cetera. That's historic. And and we did this as African American students from a from a from a teacher who had the vision and the timing all came together to do it. It hasn't been seen since then. 